Can you continue without an additional break? Yeah. Till when? The schedule is uh, maximum up to seven. Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Okay. So we will do have a break in between, not during one. Okay. Now we go at least one through one model, and then we make a break. So uh, the first model I want to describe is a cultural encounter model of communication. Uh, first I refer to the classical communication model each of you knows. It's translated in mechanical, mechanical communication model. It's, uh, it's the idea that if the sender is sending correctly, the channel is okay, then exactly what has been in the world of the sender afterwards is in the world of the uh, receiver. And when we send our email, we certainly want <laughs> the world to be that way. <laughs> uh, and for all mechanical, technical systems, this might be uh, a good model to understand how communication functions and if there is a problem, we say it's either, either the receiver is, is wrong, the channel is wrong, or the center is wrong. Because normally it should function, and it should function the way that reality of A is reality of B then. And certainly for living organisms trying to communicate, this is not a good basic idea. Because if two people do not understand each other, they have to think either me is wrong, our communication is wrong, or you are wrong. And so coming from the biological as well as the sociological systemic systems, uh, I made uh, this didactic model saying each living organism is living in its own world. It's like a bubble, reality bubble. And it's almost not understandable that two reality bubbles somehow manage to coordinate their realities in a way that they believe they are in the same reality. So we, ch we change position from which we approach encounter and communication. And for example, uh, Francisco Varela and Umberto Maturana, they say theoretically there is no world outside because world can be always only be percepted by perception and perception is my organism. We cannot be sure that there is a world outside. And so when two living organisms meet, they can offer each other's hints that ho and hope that they reorganize their, their reality in a way that I can connect to it. It's so that we find a level of reacting in a way that uh, we can predict what the other person do or understand if the person does something that we do not understand and somehow believe that we are in the same world. But this is an extra effort. It's not natural. Uh, it has to be built up culturally. And if you are in the same culture, you learn a lot, a lot of things that gives you the ability to believe that you live in the same world. As law, as, uh, as uh, when you meet a person from a very different culture, you find out that it's not natural. The other person has very different ideas about reality, and now you have a lot of problems to how how can you to tell this person what your reality is, or and maybe you will not be successful, and it's a moderate goal to find ways to. Um, connect to each other so that everybody has a, a fairly uh, reliable idea what the other person will do. 
So it's not the romantic idea, we are living in one world, it's more the pragmatical idea. What can we do to act everybody in his, her own world in a way that we can build up a community and have something like a shared reality? And this model has implications. It's saying uh, whenever two people communicate, uh, there are cultures which meet each, each other. This might be Chinese and Germans. This might be psycho, uh, um, psychotherapists and organizational people. This might be men and women, members of big companies and small companies. And whenever they think the other person knows my reality and when I use specific words, understands, can image what I mean, it might be wrong. We have to do a lot to be sure that we somehow are on the same track. So the cultural encounter model is not a model of nationalities meeting. It's a model of every communication, because you can look at any co every communication from the perspective of cultures are meeting. I said it already, it does not assume that mutual understanding is normal. It's a cultural effort. Each communicator involved is predominantly oriented to his and or her own reality. And it's, that's just normal. If you do not manage to overcome this and, and find mutual understanding, it's normal that everybody uh, understands and reacts to the world in his own reality bubble. This means that uh, investing in understanding means understanding as far as it is possible in my bubble how the other person is organized in his or her bubble. It's not a one-to-one -one translation possible, but I, I find a way to translate it into my bubble that solid action and reaction is to a certain extent possible. And in complex systems, this is complexity, there's always a rest that we both might not yet have detected that we live in very different world. We only had the fictions, now we are together. And many, for example, couples live for 20, 30 years with the idea we are in, in one reality and there's a whole area of reality uh, that is not together. And and at a certain point in life, uh, this part of reality uh, brings a lot of influence and then they think, what has been wrong with our being together? Sometimes nothing has been wrong. There have been areas where they could not meet and maybe can never meet. So, Yeah, the consequence is that uh, creating shared reality is a necessary extra effort and you need communication, sometimes you need communication specialists to do that. So, and, and here uh, we can make use uh, of concepts of the SHIF school. Yeah. Uh, this is the result of it levels, encounter level of communication in order, if you assume that we are very different in our reality, then you started, are we refer referring to the same facts? When you think, for example, uh, two companies get to go together and say, talk about success. So, to, what, what are the data on which they look when they want to think about success? 
and they might be very different. If they are on the, on the same directed to the same data, then the next question is do they is the meaning of these data and the relevance of these perspectives of facts do they share this? And the third level is do they have a shared understanding how things and people interact? So they both might mean that money is important for satisfaction. Satisfaction is important for functioning well, but they have very different ideas uh, what you have to do that uh, what um, that people earn the money they make them satisfied. So this is level three. The relationships between things they can agree upon might be still different. And if you combined your worlds enough, then you are at the level to think about and if we see the world in this way, how can we then understand responsibilities and achievements? Instead, our habitual cultural response is in assuming level one, two, three is clear, but we have a a, a problem on level four. And I guess you, uh, for the um, challenge to build up shared realities, you can immediately agree that this is a, a, a model that helps people, if it's not easy, to build it step by step, build it up step by step. Uh, who of you are familiar with uh, the shift family and the concepts of shift family and the discount levels? That's commonly known. Okay. So <coughs> it's not easy to detect that this is um, based on the shift discount level idea. And they at that time said uh, problems usually appear on level four, but you are due to mismatching on level one to three. That's very good idea. Uh, but we have to change shifts terminology in order to describe relationship between ships between equals. Because the uh, world of shifts they dealt with heavy disturbed schizophrenics was we are representatives of a reality that should not be questioned. And the others have to adopt to this a reality and every misadaption has to be confronted. And even for psychotherapy, I don't know whether this is really a good attitude, but certainly not for uh, uh, sharing realities between equals of all kinds. So we need to change uh, the terminology. And point four, I already said, it shows these different levels that have to be built up to come to a shared reality. So I changed terminology. Instead of discount, this person is discounting relevance of my frame of reference. There's also an account, and that's uh, uh, there are two sides of the process if we talk about how do we look at things. Yeah, I agreed with that. That's what I, how I see it as well. But I do not see it this way. And this does not mean uh, I do not like it. It means I look at it from a different perspective. And then we can talk about what the implications and the consequences from the perspectives is and which perspective will help us to cooperate. And if something is accounted, and should be changed the frame of reference and you can call it recount. So discount, account, recount are in the GIF frame of reference internal mechanisms. Do our really recount it. So in, a, in the conversation we had here, so uh, there was a uh, maybe uh, the consequences and 
internal recount when Hazel's a classical system of accounting what things mean come back. They certainly will come back habitually and then it's important whether the, something from our conversations triggers her to recount that and discount all belief patterns. So then we have not only redefinition, we have definition and we have co-definition. That's the communication part of the same process. And instead of discount level, there is a reality that is discounted. We have levels of matching realities, building up accounts, mutual accounts. And symbiosis, I enlarged, and we'll have a whole chapter on that, I enlarged uh, the horizons for the concept uh, of symbiosis to organizations. The classical interpretation is coming from mother-child relationship, symbiosis, if it's two private people want to act together as one. Yeah. And it's a long way to the oil company is in symbiosis with a totalitarian system in Africa to exploit resources and cheat the inhabitants. Yeah. So, because nobody knows what reality really is, and in each company at each point in time it might be different, at many points in the reality, it's not necessary to define the valid reality for that company, it's more important that people, whenever they notice that it's not working together the way they look at reality, that they have a tradition of uh, responsibility dialogues. Yeah, you did something that does not fit my understanding what you should have done at that point. Can we sit together and find out, uh, use this example to understand what your understanding of responsibility system is and my responsibility system is. And it might be that the developments call for new responsibilities who have not been in your view and not been in my view and it was not a problem up to now, but now we are in a situation it it leads to a problem. So it's not you, you are 40 or me are 40, we have to talk about what are the necessar necessary responsibilities in the systems that should be uh, served and who and how can that be done so that we do not have gaps. And I guess most of you in, in companies know how difficult this is really to talk to each other about that. And especially in our times where many people are, have too, uh, too much big workload, they do not like to discuss it because there is a lot of not taking responsibility. And if you really confront yourself with that, this would mean to reorganize or really to do more work, uh, rearrange your work, to rearrange your, your roles, the kind of workloads you have and so on. And so, out of many reasons, not only personal uh, reasons, it's not easy to introduce uh, responsibility dialogues to organizations. But without, uh, it's a problem. I think it's even more difficult when you've got unions representing you, yeah. the workforce, because yeah. they're coming from a different frame of reference. Yeah. Yeah. So you need all this in cultural encounter mm -hmm. thing and, and this makes clear you cannot come together and start with your work. You have to come together and do a lot of cultural encounter before you can start the work. And it's cheaper to do that instead of starting with the work and dealing with all these mm -hmm. uh, mismatching problems later. Mm -hmm. And I have a, it's on a, in a, another chapter, I have a, a nice picture on that. Too. And, this and I guess to do that you have to be willing to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm which is 
another cultural yeah. cultural problem. I'm thinking about BA yeah. and the stand up when mm, especially when Wash was there. Yeah. Certainly. So these are all concepts. Sorry. I have to say in regards to the unions, um, I work a lot with Chupi and um, you know, once once a trans once a transfer or you know, service takeover is, is expressed, the employees run straight to the union. And if we are really clear about our communication with them, they generally calm down and the unions just kind of disappear. They can't, they might turn up to the first two, three meetings. But by the time the actual transfer takes place, they're just kind of like, yeah, whatever. And, but it's the communication that we have with the GP reps and with the HR people that, that can generally, so it can be done. I think it's a bit more difficult when you haven't got management present and the only person that is present is the union. So who do you yes, go to yeah, yeah, nobody yeah. there? It's really interesting, Fran. Your job is really about brokering. Absolutely, that is your job. Yeah, yeah. And I was talking to someone about it the other day because because I work solely with partners. I don't win. I don't. My company doesn't bid to the end user. My partner does, and I just provide the people underneath. Hmm. So you know, quite often, my, you know, I say to my partner managers who are there to keep the customer happy, I say, look, you do what you've got to do. My job is to make sure that when the customer decides they don't want to work with our partner anymore, they still yeah. want us to stay. And so we do work very separately. Yeah. And it's very much about the relationship right. between, because our partners, yeah. they work in yeah. separate yeah. towns. Yeah. We're the people who are actually sitting with the customer yeah. at yeah. the desks or using yeah. the same canteen. Right. And that's the relationship mm. that we want yeah. to build. In practice, people like you are doing a lot of uh, of uh, what I'm making concepts yeah. for, mm. and I'm not inventing the world by making this concept. What mm. uh, what happens is that many uh, competent people develop a new practice, mm. but uh, the policy and the self-definition and the concepts, for example, in TA, are not changed. Mm. They do it in a kind of private mm. development mm. of ideas. Yeah. And when we as an association and as a school want to survive, we have to, uh, to, uh, to underlay mm. these good practices with new concepts and new professional uh, self-understandings. And it's, it's a really hard line to draw and I get very passionate about people labelling the resources that we have within mm -hmm. our customer base as not labelling them as the management mm -hmm. and the owner of the contracts. Mm -hmm. Because they can quite, they, they all too often want to blame the guy that's standing in front of them, mm -hmm. you know, and it's trying to build that culture as the services are trans, transforming. I mean, the, the past incumbents lost the business because they didn't do it right. Mm -hmm. And so we're going in and we're going, right, let's really focus on building this relationship so that they get what they want, but they're also not looking at the guys on site and going, you are what's delivering the service because they're not they're just the product uh, they're our product mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're you mm -hmm. know they're working for us we're delivering the service yeah. and this leads to, to another mm -hmm. question of economy of where to focus on because yeah. so in between two people mm -hmm. many problems of the system are compensated mm -hmm. and this is okay because people are creative mm -hmm. but it uh, up to a certain extent and mm -hmm. then the system has to change mm -hmm because otherwise it's just mm -hmm. too strenuous for all these individuals to live with a, with a bad mm -hmm. system. I mean, like I was saying, I, mean, I, work, I work from home, my company's in Northampton, but if I, well, as soon as I work on a project, the first thing I do is go and sit on my customer site mm -hmm. so that I can get to know my customer. Mm -hmm. I get to know who that end user is and, mm -hmm. you know, what they wear, when they go for lunch, when they clock in, when they clock out, mm -hmm. so that I can try and match that. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Well, Sprint, what was your comment around the um, responsibility dialogues and an experience, or many experiences I've had with parts of organisations who shy away from responsibility dialogue because um, they're protecting their work, completely protecting their work. One particular team I'm thinking of were very aware that if they changed their behaviour, it would help uh, the financial 
results of the organisation mm -hmm. and help other parts of the organisation, but it would mean that there would be less of them working. So they refused to change yeah. how they were working, highlight it to management, yeah. talk to anyone else about right, it, right. because that meant that they kept themselves mm. in contact. All these models only can help you to competently invite. Because if somebody decided that they do not want to take the invitation, these kind of concepts are uh, at their end. Yeah. And then that's a question of power, of structural power, whether you can change something like this or not. And yet the system adjusts yeah. right. actually to say that we don't want you working that way because yeah. it's not working for us yeah. ultimately anyway. So the system will force that conversation at some point. Yes. But, but I think we have a uh, a lot of chances to competently invite we do not use. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that, such a system is a result of years of not uh, working on responsibility culture. Yeah. So that's at the end point. What I try to do is just to help to, to, to give uh, concepts and uh, procedures and awareness uh, that it's important to build up responsibility culture and do your best because if you are defensive um, you, you take the power you take your own power yeah. and you misbehave and then you get slapped instead of answered to your question yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is a point where I want to mention that also, the shift material, what is, I love it because the shift material is the, material, the most important material in TA world that is dealing with reality, mm. with understanding of the reality. And this is why we can use it so much. <coughs> and uh, the shift definition of the frame of reference is a meta program which integrates all ego states and their interaction. So it's an, an integrating meta program within the person and there is a, uh, and on the other side the ego states are activate uh, activate frames of references and frames of references activate ego states and interaction so it's a mutual uh, influencing system and instead of stepping into a frame of reference and then trying to change ego states it might be much more effective that you be very careful to activate the right frame of reference because the frame of reference activates attitudes, roles and so on. And this is why a cultural work that activates constructive frame of reference in each of the players uh, is much more effective instead of leaving the culture as it is and helping everybody to be an artist on uh, on compensating. And this has a lot of consequences to the question uh, whom do I train and what do I train somebody? Uh, because as long as the culture is, is miserable, you need high professionals to perform. When you uh, make the culture better, you can, you can uh, even mediocre qualified professional can do a wonderful job. It's also an economical question in what to invest. And to be true, we do not have so many high professionals. We need to <coughs> develop cultures that everybody can do useful work with limited competence. So, and I'm at the point uh, changing terminology, so frame of reference means culture. That's a meta program which organizes roles and plays. It's, it's just normal that you act positively because the culture is that way. Yeah? In other cultures it's just normal that you be selfish and you need to overcome your own selfishness without changing the culture that's too strenuous over time. Professional roles activate frame of references. This is why you should be aware of which role is yours at that point. 
and which frame of reference is fitting this role, not, wor not working with the other frame of reference that is not fitting the role, and frame of references activate roles, and the interplay of roles. Yeah, I've said all that already. I don't have to repeat it because I have the child left. <laughs> so, this is a cultural encounter communication model. Does it make sense to you? Yeah. Has it, not in practice, but as a conceptualization, has it something new in it for you? Yeah. Or, or how do you think about it? I'm still trying to get my head around it. So it's new. Yes. But it's familiar. Yeah. So, but it's a different, different way for me to look at things. Yeah. So, so I'm a bit shaken up by it, a bit confused. Oh, so, that's good. Yeah, 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 in a good <laughs> way. <laughs> in a good way. So, yeah. so it's new enough to confuse you. Or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't. I, can't I, I guess I can see bits, but I can't see all. Mm. So, I think we should have a break now. Mm.